Hi, good evening, and welcome to the Comics Experience Graphic Novel of the Month Club for the month of June. Uh, and our book this month is, I think, a really special one. Um, uh, it's Gender Queer by Maya Kobabi, who I'm really, really, really happy to have here next to me um, to talk about this book. Uh, you guys uh, like Are you going to sneak in for oh! name correction? Yeah. Maya Kobabe. Okay, Kobabe. I'm sorry. No, absolutely no worries. Um, almost no one gets it the right the okay. first time. And I think practicing it my entire life, correcting people, was really good practice to correct people with my pronouns as an adult. <laughs> yeah, very I actually good. think it really primed me for my later in life experience. Yeah. So, yeah, no worries. Yeah. Okay. You guys all like the book, right? Yeah. 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 Love it. Love it. Um, and before we really, really start, I want to, I want to apologize in advance because I'm sure at some point I'm going to ask something dumb or or misasked because I'm a 55-year-old straight white guy and it's hard for me to figure stuff out sometimes. So I am not worried about that at all cool. because I, first of all, I did volunteer. <laughs> I wrote this book. Um, <laughs> And I, I mean, I very intentionally stepped into the role of someone yeah. who is going to be answering this question. So yeah. I'm, it's very welcome. And okay. I also, like, any question that is asked out of a place of, like, genuine desire to, like, understand another human experience, I'd say is a good question. Yeah. And the only bad question is one that is one coming from a place of, like, meanness yeah. or trying to catch someone out. So yeah. I don't think you're going to ask anything. Okay. Like, I, just, I just wanted to no, sort of blanket yeah. that ahead of time. If I screw up the, the pronoun, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to do some sort of thing that's going to embarrass me horribly, uh, in my own head at least. So, don't worry you know, about it. I, I'm so, I'm I'm so grateful really, to be here. I'm actually really more worried about this interview than I've been like... <sighs> Like with like interviewing Neil Gaiman or something, you know, because like I don't want to mess this one up. I don't want to mess this one up. I I and that you know because I. All right, so one of the things that comics does, I think, very well, is allows you to be in a place in a headspace that you would never have considered, and it's because comics are an internal mechanism when you read them, right? Yeah. You know, you hear the voice in your head. It's not something that's being projected to you. Mm -hmm. It's your internalizing comics when you read them. And so a book like this to me is, and, and, and you might be embarrassed that I'm going to say this, is like a Persepolis or a Mouse or, or a Pyongyang or another book like that, which is really putting out an experience that I would never have any other way of knowing and allowed me to personalize it in my own head and, and to understand it better, mm -hmm. you know, probably not all the way, but better. Yeah. And, and I think that's incredibly powerful, incredibly wonderful. Thank and you. so I want to thank you for that. Uh, and I want to thank you for l for giving me this experience. I I I don't get a lot of comics that that allow me to do that, and and that's important. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely part of why I wanted to write it. And mm -hmm. it's I, I agree with you about like God, I just love comics so much. <laughs> um, and there, yeah, there is there's just that magic that happens in the gutter where you're your brain fills in the action is not there and turns it into something that's alive and not just still yep. on the page. And there's, you know, several people have asked me, to, why did you tell this story in comics other than another format, other than in prose or just, you know, speaking it? And I was like, I mean, first of all, it's what I love. It's what I just trained in. You know, I have mm -hmm. a master's degree in comics. Mm -hmm. It's the way I feel most fluent in communicating with the world. And I also think there's something about comics, the way that you can write something in words and then contradict it in the art. Yeah. That just allows for so much nuance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, comics are the best medium in the world. <laughs> it's, it's, and you see, I didn't even have to ask why comics. <laughs> e answered it without me doing okay. it. <laughs> I'm into the. I'm into yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Um, but why comics? Go back. Go. Go. No. No. I mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean it more like. Why in my life? Yeah. yeah. Why? Why did you make that decision? Uh, wh when did you start reading? Like, what's your earliest memories of comics? My very earliest memories of comics are from probably about age three and four of my dad taking every Sunday the new, the Sunday paper and spreading it out flat and like lying down on the floor and me and my sibling lying down on either side mm -hmm. and him reading them, each one out loud to us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like my very earliest memory. 
Um, and I, if you've read the book, you'll know that I was a very late reader. I didn't learn to read until I was 11. I'm very dyslexic. I'm a right brain thinker. Um, and so comics were a good gateway book for me, as for many people. Um, you know, since there's less words per page and you get a lot of context through the art, um, I read comics like early in my reading. Um, mostly collections of newspaper strips. Like mm -hmm. my library had really good. They had like you know they had all the peanuts. They had all the foxtrot. They had sure. all the zits, mutts. You know every, mm -hmm, everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I started just drawing little comics, you know, as a kid, as I think many kids do. Mm -hmm. um, but then I really went and I focused on children's book illustration for a while. And so when I was in undergrad, um, I was totally thinking just book illustration, kind of much more fine arty um, direction. And I, uh, I had a children's book manuscript that I was trying to push that no one was interested in. And I was going to events. I don't know if people know the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. It is a really good organization for people who want to get into that field. But I, was, I went to their conferences and I was hearing things like, oh, you know, you, you, you work on your portfolio and you submit for five years or seven years or nine years and then publishers from above deigns to give you a book deal. And I was like, I can't wait that long. I gotta be making books right now. Um, whereas in that same year, I went to my first um, comic conventions. I went to WonderCon and um, Alternative Press Expo when they were both here still both here, in, yeah, in San Francisco. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, one, in one sort of, I think one was in the summer and one was in the fall. And um, I had like my first little like five page little stapled together, you know, little tiny comic that I'd made. Mm -hmm. And people were like, oh, you made a comic? Welcome, you're a comics mm -hmm, author. Mm -hmm. And people would like, you know, I'd go up to people and I'd be like, oh, I made this comic. Do you maybe like want to mm -hmm, look at it? And mm -hmm. they'd be like, oh, do you want to trade? And mm -hmm. Ed Luce, who's a local author who writes mm -hmm. Wevelable Oaf, mm -hmm. traded me the full color issue one of Wevelable Oaf for my five page little thing that I ran mm -hmm. off and treated me like such a professional. And so I really felt like children's books was this like walled garden with right. a moat and a gate and it was trying to keep me out. Whereas comics was like a hug and it was like welcoming me in. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, well, I still want to do children's books, but in the meantime, I think I'm going to self-publish comics because that seems to be a cool thing that people are, that do and are into. And it's, it is, it's, it's wants newcomers to come into it. Yeah. So that was yeah. sort of, God, I love that story. I love yeah. everything about that story. And you know what makes me sad about that story is that we don't have WonderCon or, or the Alternative Press I Expo know. here in the Bay Area anymore. They and, were and such good shows. They were such good shows. And yeah. every attempt to replace a show in San Francisco has been a pop culture movie star, TV star, I know. autograph show. Um, I do love SF Zine Fest. Sure. And that I've done every year since 2013. Sure. That's a good one, but it's kind of the only thing that's yeah. left. And yeah. we used to have a bunch. And um, that gets talked about so much in indie comics communities. And several people have been like, Maya, do you ever want to organize a show? And I'm like, not right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the people who do run SF Zine Fest are really great. And I know that they have, they're all constantly dreaming about bigger venues. And mm -hmm. so we'll see. That may, maybe that will grow and expand. Yeah. Well, the problem has always been Moscone yes. doesn't want to give dates more than six months in advance. And you can't do a show like a comic show in six, with six, in months. six months. It's not no. possible, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, boy, that was a tangent. I'm yeah, sorry. that is uh, inside baseball <laughs> over here. <laughs> but yeah. But That's anyway. Um, yeah. So I, after a couple of years after undergrad, um, I audited a class that was taught by Matt Sillity, who mm -hmm. is now the chair of the MFA in Comics program at CCA. But that did not exist yet. And so I audited a class with him, and I loved it so much. And that's when I started. Um, a webcomic called The Thief's Tale, which I worked on for many years and is completely in a hiatus right now. Um, and he, halfway through class, was like, can, I, can you keep a secret? And I was like, yes. And he was like, I'm trying to start this MFA program at CCA. Would you be interested in applying for it? And I was like, absolutely. So I was like right in on the ground floor of that. Mm -hmm. So I applied in the first ever class and graduated from there in 2015. And at the end of the, one, end of the program, uh, CCA bought a lot of tables at shows. And I, um, I got to table with Ed Luce, who was one of my thesis advisors. And it was just this beautiful moment of like, you were the person who, like for the first person who like made me feel like a real, a real player in comics, or like a real person trying to do comics. And now here, like th four years later, I'm behind the table and we're tabling next yeah. to each other and we're selling our stuff working yeah. right next to each other. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I was just like, comics, yeah. I love you forever. Like yeah. I'm in. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, what was that first year like at CCA? 
Uh, I mean, do you think we're, I, I, and I'm, this is yeah. surely me asking, this is not a gotcha question, but yeah. it, we, did they have it together? Did, uh, they, did they have the program figured out yet, do you think? Uh, or? They were one step ahead. Okay. <laughs> one half step ahead of, uh -huh. us, of where uh -huh. we were soon. We call it, um, we of the class of 2015 call, each, uh, call ourselves the guinea pig class. Right. Yeah. Um, when we started, there were exactly... 12 students in the whole program mm -hmm. and it was during the summer and there were like four teachers and it was like the 16 of us were like the only people on the whole campus. Right. So it felt very private, mm -hmm. it felt intimate, it felt experimental mm -hmm. um, and amazing and just like the most uh, exciting, fun, weird comics summer camp for adults. Mm -hmm. That's what it mm -hmm. felt like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how, many of, how many of your classmates have gone on to do a a book? Um, that's such a good question. I feel like it's at um, least half, right? So well, Sam Satin is yeah. one in my grade, and mm -hmm. he's published a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. Glint came out from mm -hmm. Lion Forge, mm -hmm. and the um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it. The one that's set in the Bay, the post-apocalyptic animal story yeah, yeah. legend. Um, Trinidad Escobar was in my grade, and mm -hmm. she has a book deal um, of Sea and Venom. It's mm -hmm. coming out in about one to two years. Yeah. Um, a very good friend of mine who's in the book, Ashley Guillory, is now a storyboard artist in Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. she actually went a little bit away from comics through the much related field of storyboard art. Sure. Um, and uh, Bex, who's a classmate of ours, is in the middle of laboring through just a masterpiece. This is going to blow people's heads off, but she needs two or three more years yeah. on it, probably. Um, and then one of them, when I was a full-time teacher at an art school in, uh, on the East, um, one person I've a little bit lost touch with, but he has self-published a ton of stuff, and he's based in Columbus, Ohio. So everyone, pretty much everyone, is doing yeah. comics, but people have threaded out into different paths a little. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I remember coming out and talking to your class too. You did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We met um, yeah. briefly in yeah. probably it was probably 2015. Yeah. You came and visited Melanie Gilman, mm -hmm. another person who's in the book. Yep. And I sketched you in yep, my sketchbook. Yep, yep. Oh, did you? I did, yeah. Oh. I didn't bring that with me. Oh. Yeah. Wow. I'll, me I'll, email, I'll email that to you later. Cool, no, I would love to see that. Yeah. I'd love to see that. I, I remember you actually asked some pretty good questions, if I remember correctly. Oh, I'm sure I asked yeah. great questions. Yeah. 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 Real good questions. Well, no, no, because, you know, some people don't ask any questions, and some people yeah. are. Well, uh, I... It wasn't, it wasn't that year. The, the next year I went there was one guy, I can't remember who it is, he was really combative. He, like, wanted to challenge everything mm. about comics, and mm. so... I was the mainstream comic guy to challenge, I guess. That's so and I'm like, hilarious. I'm, I mean, okay, here's how Marvel does business, but I don't want to defend that. <laughs> I guess that's, that's, not, that's not what I'm trying to, you know. Yeah, I read your the speech from the retailers' mm, convention. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. thought that was a great. Thank you. That was a great speech. Thank you. Yeah. 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 It was it was important to me to come out and talk to uh, a, a graduating class of future cartoonists because. You know, looking at other schools that were putting out people, I I never thought that the actual how do you sell things mm. portion of it was ever particularly like well taught. Yeah, certainly right? not in undergrads. <laughs> yeah. Certainly not in undergrad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so I thought it was important to have someone come out and go, here's how the market works. You know, yeah. these are useful things to know, probably, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a couple years later that you, you have a book. I mean, that yeah. is not very long. No. So how did this come about? How did this come about? The process. Um, so anyone who follows me on Instagram will n remember, perhaps, that I started posting a series called Gender Queer, but one word squished together, um, in October of 2016. Um, they're little. They're like this big. I actually brought some of the originals. Ooh. Um they're like, this is, I drew them in a notebook like this. I'll sort of aim oh, this nice. at the camera a little bit. Um, so six to a sheet um, in these. Uh, these are Waldorf main lesson books for people who recognize what that is. Um, and I started, I started, I started them because I was really frustrated. I was starting to come out as non-binary uh, to my family and immediate friends, sort of an intimate circle to begin with. And... Um, I have a very loving and accepting family, as anyone who's read the book knows. Um, so it wasn't hard in that sense. It was hard in the sense of me saying, hey, I've been thinking about gender every single day since I was 12, and this is like some of the things that I've come to and what it means to me. And people being like, we love you, we support you, we don't understand what you're talking about because we have not been thinking about gender, maybe at all, ever, um, depending on the person. Um, 
And so I kept having these conversations with people where I would try to explain, like, well, this is what I mean by that, or this is where I'm coming from, and I just never felt like I could finish my point. Like, I would either, they would ask a question, or um, I would get on a tangent, or something would be time to make dinner, or just, like, life, and I would just be like, ah, oh, I just never can explain what I'm trying to say. And I'm um, going back to comics, and I was like, I need to try to write about this because I need time to sit down by myself and explain and get the thought out in a complete form, a concise form. And comics are the medium that I've been trained in, that I love so much, that I think would be good, good for this. Um, so I started writing these, just these little things, and they were totally non-chronological. I just, anytime I had a thought that related to gender, I would just draw it in whatever order and not try to make any kind of overarching narrative. Mm -hmm. um, an, an artist that really, there were a few artists that really inspired me in those really early stages. One was James Kachalka. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at American Elf. I straight up just ripped off the American Elf sure. little format, even mm -hmm. the little title, the way it was lettered. Mm -hmm. um, I obviously was a big fan of, of Alison Bechtel, Fun Home. I also really like um, Lucy Nisley's um, memoir work, mm -hmm. um, especially like the very simple sort of dot eye style. So I was just pouring out these little things, and I, I drew 60 of them before I showed them to anyone because. Uh, I was very scared about uh, talking publicly about stuff that's so inner. Um, I am by nature actually a pretty introverted, introverted and shy person. Um, and before this experience of coming out and writing about it publicly, I would, like if you had told me when I was like 20 that I would be sitting here talking about this sort of thing in front of anyone, I'd been like, absolutely not. Um, so it's been a journey. Um, anyway, but so I wrote all these strips because I was like, I just have to express this somehow and words are not enough. Um, and then I chose the Inktober challenge and I was like, I ha I'm going to post one every day on mm -hmm. Instagram. And I use that challenge to force myself to post them because there were a few where I'm like writing about something like masturbation or something. And I was like, oh, I don't want to post this one. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to see this. And I would post it at like three in the morning in hopes that like it wouldn't be seen. But that's not how the <laughs> algorithms work. Anyway, um, so I... So that was like a trial by fire of like posting them and being like, what, is re what response is this going to get? And the response it got was... Uh, like amazing, like people just um, respond to them so much more than any of the fiction work I had ever done up to that point. Mm -hmm. I'd been working, I said this mentioned, this series called The Thief's Tale, which mm -hmm. is a black and white, all ages, medieval fantasy story mm -hmm. that I worked on for five years. I produced 300 pages of that, mm -hmm. all of which are sitting in my closet mm -hmm. doing nothing at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from it though. Sure. Um, and people, I'd been posting online and people were like, oh yeah, it's, you know, um, and then I started writing about gender and identity and sexuality and all of those things in their confusing and multiple forms. And people were immediately like, this, this, I feel this too. I did, never knew there was a word for this. Um, I, I thought I was the only person in the world who felt this. I didn't know I wasn't alone, things like that. And, um, and so I did that for almost two years before I was like, oh, I think there's a book in this. Okay. Um, and it was the little tiny zines. Um, I took them. Um, Props, I love it. Yeah. No, I'm really glad. Some people yeah, do yeah, and yeah. some people don't. I'm, um, it makes life so much better. They look like this. They're very small. Nice. Um, so by this point, um, I've been doing it for like two years, so we're into mid-2017. Mid tw tw what are years? Um, <laughs> 2017, I guess. So my friend Sam, who I already mentioned, mm -hmm. had gotten a book deal at Lion Forge, mm -hmm. and his editor was Andrea Colvin, who's mm -hmm. wonderful. And he emailed her these, and she apparently sat there for an hour and read all of them. We're like, yes, these are good. Mm -hmm. And so Sam was like, she said they are good. Meet her at Comic-Con. Say they're a friend of mine. And so I went up to her after a panel at Comic-Con, and I gave her these, and she was like, oh, yes, yes, I like these very much. Here's my business card. We'll put a pitch together. And I was like, oh, wow, thank you. Um, so my initial pitch was, dear Lion Forge, would you like to take these little comics that I've drawn, I have like 150 of them, and produce, I was imagining just like a really cute small book that's like mm. four by four inches and like an inch thick. Mm -hmm. They're just collecting all the work I'd already done. Right. And they were like, no, no, we don't want to do that. Um, but how about you take all the same material, expand it, turn it from vignettes into a narrative, comic size page, yep. full color. What yep. about that? And yep. I said, Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I said yes, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was the sort of genesis of this. Did that did the, the prospect of that scare you or 
thrill you or both? Um, I was so ready to have a book deal. Okay, okay. Uh, mostly I was excited. And um, for me, right in, for me, the most difficult part of comics is thumbnailing and writing. I sure. feel like I'm more of an artist that's had to Understood. learn how to write. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that I had so much of it written already yeah. felt like a huge... Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, yeah. I just, um, I don't know, if I, even if I were waiting for that book deal, I think I would be daunted by, okay, now I've got to take these sketches and turn it into a book, right? Because they're, they're different things in a fundamental way, right? I think that the main thing was I didn't know how much I was going to have to say. Mm. So I was like, they were like, when you turn it into a book, I was like, well, how long does it have to be? Can it be like 100 pages? Mm. And they were like, well, let's say at least 120, because that's mm -hmm. like a, you know, that's like mm -hmm. a trade. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, 120. And then I started writing and I was like, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be like 150 maybe. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I did, I was like, maybe pushing 200. Right. I turned in a draft that was 260 pages okay. and they, they, we had to edit it down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it was just when I started writing, I was like, oh no, I have a lot to say. Yeah. 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 And I, and, and one of the things I find that's really beautiful about the book is that you talk about a whole lot of things that are not gender or not, they're just, who you are as a person, the, 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 the obsessive lists you made of books when you were a right. kid, which to me, like, I totally related to that. Right. Like, there were all these entry points. The commonalities, I thought, were the, the great part of this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, um, uh... Yeah, I tell people it's a book about gender and identity and being a nerd who reads a lot. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That it is. So, how, what was your process of taking, you said 150? Yeah, or there's about. There's yeah. about. What was your process of taking that and then turning into a manuscript, I guess? Did you turn it into a manuscript? Um, did you, not did you a re thumb one. roll? Uh, like. So, I printed them all out. Okay. And I cut them up and I laid them on the floor in chronological order mm -hmm. because I'd never done that before. And. I looked at them, and that's when I realized, like, what I Production order. Uh, no, the order of my life chronologically. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Because, life order, okay. Life mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. um, because I had not done that when I was writing them, and that helped me figure out, like, what areas I had cl clearly covered more and mm -hmm. which areas I had completely left out. And basically what I realized was that I had done a lot of strips about the... Like, um, the previous three to four years and much less about the earlier parts of my life. Right. So I was like, oh, I have, like six about childhood and like four about high school and then like 20 about college and then like 50 about grad school or whatever mm -hmm, it was. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, I'm really going to have to fill in the earlier life stuff. Mm -hmm. Handily, I've been keeping a journal since I was 12. Mm -hmm. So I read all of my journals and what I discovered is I've been the same person the whole time. And, um, but I was able to then like remember like, oh yeah, okay. And then pull sort of like memories. And that's when there are... Places where there are conversations that there none of the conversations are like verbatim, but they are to my best of my memory in a condensed form. Sure, of form. course. So that's some of, but there are a few lines of like dialogue that are like directly pulled from like journal entries. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was really that was really useful. And then I, whenever possible, I just traced mm -hmm. the small comics, mm -hmm. but I had to redraw. I would say seventy five percent of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but at the but at the point where you're turning it from those 150 illus the, the, the mm -hmm. strips, mm -hmm. I should say, not mm -hmm. illustrations, mm -hmm. uh, to a manuscript of some kind so that it can be edited, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. that, uh, the, yeah. I'm, I'm getting the steps yeah. there, yeah. So you're not, you're not what, are you, are you, are you, what are you drawing? What are you tracing at that point? Well, <laughs> um... Like, what, what, what was it that Andrea was looking for from you? Was she looking for a written script? Was she looking for a thumbnailed book? Was she... This is what my thumbnails look like. Okay, okay. Not much. Yeah. Not much, folks. Yeah. yeah. Not much. Yeah. Um, I thumbnailed almost entirely at full page size in really tatty uh, composition books. And uh, I would say the main thing that, and that I needed to turn into Andrea and that I needed to figure out was... 
um, how many words can I fit on a page and like where do the page breaks need to be mm -hmm. and how long does the scenes need to be mm -hmm. um, and I was also very aware that probably pages were going to be pulled during the editorial process mm -hmm. so I, I never I wanted every single scene to end at the bottom of a page mm -hmm. I never have a scene start in the middle of a page and I also there really aren't any double page spreads in the book because I had a feeling things would get plucked and rearranged sure. and I wouldn't have a, a huge amount of control sure. over that um, so yeah, so what I turned into Andrea was like, this is the flow of it. Like this is how it's gonna, this is, this is what it's gonna read like in a narrative form instead of a series of vignettes. Yeah. And um, I would say the mo most editorial process was her going, especially the early, the first half and being like, we need more in this childhood. We mm -hmm. need more, we need more. Mm -hmm. I really almost didn't wanna talk about my childhood stuff I'm not really sure why. I think part of it was because the memories are fuzzier and mm -hmm. I just was like hesitant to, I didn't want to make anything up. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but she would be like, okay, but this is, and then every time I'd give her more, she'd be like, yeah, this is great. I love all this new stuff. Can you add a little bit more? Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, all right. So, so some of the, the decisions you're talking about are very, are very craft oriented decisions in terms of, number of words on a page, the, the scenes beginning and ending on a page. I mean, that's all craft. You literally went to a school and have a master's degree in comics. Was this taught in the school? I, and I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not trying yeah. to be critical of that. I'm just really curious about this part of it because it, there's, so there's the difference between sort of the language of comics yeah. and the craft and the specific yeah. of comics. I, that's such a good question. It's hard to remember when I learned things. Um, but I mean, I would honestly say the, the biggest thing that I learned at CCA is the scene that's in the opening of the book. And if people have read it, it's a class I took with um, Mari Nomi, mm -hmm. who's a mm -hmm. memoir comic. I'm sure you have some mm -hmm. of her stuff here. Mm -hmm. um, the big one that she had out at that time is called Kiss and Tell, mm -hmm. a romantic uh, My Romantic Adventures Age 0 to 22, I think mm -hmm. is the subtitle. Mm -hmm. um, and she really uh, pushed us to write about our secrets. And at the time I was like, no. Um, and I feel like she taught that lesson and it took me an additional four years to get it. Mm -hmm. But I did get it. So that was like, I feel like that's like a huge thing I took away from CCA that I don't know. I might have got there on my own, but it would have taken maybe 10 more years. Sure, sure. Yeah. Sure. That's usually when people say, do I need to go to a grad school to learn comics? I'm always like, no, absolutely. You can learn on your own, but it will shorten your learning curve considerably. Yeah. So. But yeah. the mechanical, the mechanical parts of comics are still like, like how many words are on a page? I, I know the one time I tried to write a script, right? I went and read. I went. I took an Alan Moore comic and I counted uh, the number of words, and I no. went, "All right, well, that's my maximum number." And then I actually wrote like twenty percent more words because oh, that's what no. you do, right? And and that's way too that's many way words. Too many way words. too many words, right? <laughs> yeah. But like, how well? Who teaches you this stuff? Like, it's not. I don't. I don't even know that. Like, there's yeah. not a rule, right? That's, no, there's it, not a rule. Um, I mean, people will give you guide. Like, there are guidelines. Like, I think there's a Neil Gaiman wrote a guideline on how to write a script. And I think he said, like, no more than 20 words per speech bubble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think he said no more than, like, 10 speech bubbles to a page. I'm make, Viewers, I'm making these sure. numbers up. Sure, sure. Um, I don't know. If, for me, it's a very... It's more. It's super feelings-y. It's almost mm -hmm. heading into the direction of poetry. Right. It's like, for me... Um, Fewer is better. Mm -hmm. So any word you can cut, mm -hmm. cut. If I'm going through and realize I've included like an adjective, I'm like, Ugh, go away. Mm. Um, so fewer is better, but it's like, I don't know. It's very hard. It's, it's this is interesting. Is, are the adjectives communicated through the art? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. not through the words, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's the art that, wow, I hadn't thought about that until you said it. See, I'm, I've been doing this for 30 <laughs> years and I can still come up with, whoa, yeah. comics theory, holy shit. Yeah. It's neat, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, okay, so, so she wants more and more and more from you. At what point did, was it enough that you knew it was enough? She knew it was enough? Um, I think probably like three drafts in, mm -hmm. um, we were both like, yeah, 
this sounds good now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, yeah. And she said something to me which was like so true, which she says, your process is very iterative. And I was like, yes. I, I am so in awe of Tilly Walden, who mm -hmm. apparently can sit down on a blank sheet of paper and just bust out a finished mm -hmm, page in one mm -hmm, go. Mm -hmm. For me, almost every piece of art that I make, it gets better every time I do another draft. Sure. And it, and it, that can be pro come problematic because I'm tempted to just make infinite drafts. Mm -hmm. Because of this thought like, oh, well, if I did it once and then I did it, it was, you know, it was 50% better the second time and then 25 additional percent better the next time. And then, you know, like ha it, like a Zeno's paradox of like it's half percent better every time you do it. Maybe I should just keep doing it forever. Like when I turned in the draft, which I usually work traditionally. This book I penciled traditionally but inked digitally to save okay. time. But when I turned in the final page of uh, digital inks, I told Andrea, if you had given me another year, I would print out these inks on paper and I would ink over them a second time traditionally. Sure. And she goes, that sounds like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can see that too because there's at least two pages, two sequences in here where, where even your storytelling is iterative, where it's where it's like a balloon that leads to a balloon that leads to the balloon that leads to the, like that's a very, f f not formula, formula is the wrong word, but. Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, the one step leads to the next step, leads yeah. to the next step, always. Yeah. Yes, into the infinite horizon. Yeah. 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 Well, that's great. I, 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 I love this book. Um, Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Because I, I can keep talking like forever, but yeah, cute. I've got one question just about the relationship with like an editor and you know getting this book to you. How much, um, how much creative control did you expect to have, and then how much were you given? And were you surprised by that? Great question. Um, I expected to have almost all the control, and I had almost all the control. Nice. <laughs> but because that I had that because. Um, Andrea and I were on the same page. Like she liked what she saw from the start and she wanted it to be successful and she defended it at every stage. And she, any, like people ask me, did she tell you like what to write? And absolutely not. She would only tell me more of this or less of this. So she would say like, um, can we make, yeah, like, can we make this scene? Can you, add, like, it seems like you have something more to say. Is there another page in this or other areas? I think we have said this in another part. Maybe this can be one page or can we take this out altogether? Um, so that was pretty much most of the things she said. And the other thing she said was, this is good. This is worth doing. This is worth your time. And that was very important to hear. Um, as I worked on it, like probably like, you know, eight to 10 hours a day, seven days a week for like a year, because I like from signing book deal to turning in final art, this book took like a year, but it's that's fast. very fast. Very fast. Um, but it's because I've been writing it for two years before Understood. that and then thinking mm -hmm. about it for, you know, mm -hmm. all of my life mm -hmm. prior to that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I feel like I had a, a ton of control. The only place where I didn't have control is that there was um, a couple pages got cut due to by legal um, because I'd included some pop culture references that I thought fell under fair use and they disagreed. So we did actually have to cut one seven page scene very late in the process, like in January of this year, it got cut. Um, and so that was the only time that I felt a little bit not in control of it was when the lawyers stepped in, um, but we worked it out, so. I mean, yeah, I had, I had drawn uh, Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings and I had drawn Sirius and Remus and I had drawn characters from Queer as Folk and I had drawn David Bowie and I had drawn, you know, a bunch of pop culture figures and they were like, we don't want to get sued. And I was like, I think this is, I think this is okay. And they're like, we disagree. And I was like, all right. Was that the part of the book about fan shipping? Yes. So and there's- Fan headcanon. Okay. Yes. I think that's what they're worried about. Yes. So there's, I mean, I do talk about fan stuff in the book, but like they're also for like in the One Direction section, I had in the first version of the page, I had just drawn the One Direction boys and they were like, oh, we can't show their faces. Oh no, oh no, 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 no. And I was like, okay, well, let's work on this. Can we show the CD cover? And they were like, mm, also no, maybe an edited version. So I drew like an edited version of the CD cover. I actually, and then even um, some of the pages that have books on them, I had drawn them with the covers showing. Right. And they said, um, you can say the title, but you can't show the cover. Sure. So I had to redraw the page so you only see the spines. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So things like that. But yeah. some cover art is in here. 
Um, I got permission for a couple of things. Mercedes Lackey gave you permission. I got permission from Mercedes Lackey to include the cover. Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, anytime there is a cover and anything that I quote is, I got permission from Alison Bechtel to include that panel. I got permission from Terry Moore for the covers of Strangers in Paradise. Mercedes Lackey. Oh, uh, I'm going to forget now. Who else? There were some. They, all of those emails were very exciting for me to receive because um, I am a big fan. Um, yeah. When um, you when you get permission for something like that, are you? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't no mean to cut worries. it off. But um, when you get permission for something like that, are you sending them the whole manuscript, or are you? How, how do you approach that as an author? Um, so it was interesting because I thought that I first I asked. Andrea was like, don't you think the email should come from you? Doesn't it seem more official if it's coming from the publisher? And she goes, I think it would be better if it came from you, actually, because it's more personal if it comes from the author. And I was like, oh, that's not what I would have expected, but all right. Um, so no, I would email the person, and I would usually say, you know, my name and what I'm working on, and I would link to something to show, like, this is a real project. I'd link to, like, the Hollywood Reporter review or mm -hmm. and, like, the Goodreads page, a few things, mm -hmm. be like, this is a real book, I promise. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, I quote or excerpt or show the cover of whatever your work on one page. I've attached to that page. If you would also like to see a full manuscript of where it's at now, mm -hmm. I will be happy to also mm -hmm. include that. But I didn't mm -hmm. usually include it in the email because some people's, like, sure. emails, if there's a big attachment, it goes to spam or sure. something. Sure. So. Well, and also authors can't just... And take manuscripts because right and I, plus I just I didn't want to like waste their time so I was like here's the one page that mm -hmm. you're thinking like Tamora Pierce is mm -hmm. another person I got permission from and I was like I include the drawing of your character and one quote here's what it looks like and like if you want to know more you can so mm -hmm. yeah how many of them asked for more does that occur no one asked for more okay. they were all like looks good looks good yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice nice yeah did you have a follow-up on that? I'm sorry, I kind of mm -hmm. cut you off. No, that was it. I was okay. excited. <laughs> <laughs> I have a follow-up to that. Yeah. Okay, what's up? <laughs> did you take out Tamora Pierce for coffee afterwards? Um, <laughs> no, I, um, so I sent her a copy as a thank you, and I signed it, and I wrote, like, a letter. Um, but it was more like I emailed her, um, you know, the, the email that's on her website, and I actually got her assistant responded to me, but said, Tammy says it looks great. And I was like, ah. So um, if I ever see her, you can bet your ass I'm going to be going up and being like, so I was the author of that book. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Um, Lion Forge is a relatively new publisher. What made you go with them other than Sam kind of pushing Andrea on you? Was that was that the? I mean, that was that was definitely the intro point. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't have gone with them if I hadn't totally clicked with Andrea like right away. Mm -hmm. And I just, um, she just like loved the project so much, and like she really shepherded it through the submissions process. Like mm -hmm. she was like, um, put together. Like, you, you know, put together your art, put together your cover letter. I'm going to look over it. And I will, if I think I need to change anything. And so we did that. We did the, with the version with the strips that was rejected. And mm -hmm. then they said, you can resubmit. And so she was like, can you pencil at least 10 pages to let me know what that would look like? And then I actually penciled 40 pages. And then I would send that to her. And so then she took it through again. So she really was like very much like, um, she was almost acting like my agent as mm -hmm. well in some mm -hmm. senses. Um, so I would say like, yeah, I, and Lion Forge has been through some changes. They certainly have. Recently. Mm -hmm. um, when I signed with Lion Forge, I mean, they were, and they still are, talking about how important diversity is to the company. And that was also very important to me. And I got to sit at their table at the Eisners last year at Comic-Con, and I looked around the table, and it was like, Andrea, my editor, uh, Steens was at that table, Amanda Meadows was at that table mm -hmm. with her husband, Sam and his wife were at that table, and uh, Hazel Newlevant was at the table, and I was like, dang, like, at this table there are two non-binary people, two Jewish men, two black women, uh, and an interracial couple, you know, there's like, you, you, I was just looking around being like, this is, like, they're walking the talk, like, this is for real, mm -hmm. like, they're, this is who makes up this company, and it felt like such a family, and I was like, I am so proud to be at this company. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, over half those people are no longer at Lion Forge yeah. post this merger. My editor Andrea um, uh, is no longer was like left literally the week my book came out. As, yeah. as did Steens, who's the other editor I'd worked with, because I'd done some pieces for Rolled and Told magazine. Right. Um, so it feels like a totally different company now in an interesting way, and I feel like um, I'm having to sort of almost like re meet um, the company 
And I'm and I, like I so I, I recently got to meet some of the people from Oni who are stepping in, and they all seem really they're all really wonderful they're people. lovely yeah. people. Yeah. Um, yeah, they are. They really are. They really are. But I feel like I almost feel like I signed with one company. I'm working for a different one yeah. now in, a, in an interesting way. So I'm yeah. I'm very curious to see. I I mentioned to someone earlier. I feel like the next one to two years of books that come out will let us know what this new polarity Lion sure. Forge Oni Press really sure. is. They kind of almost feel like we need to treat it as a new company. Yeah, totally new company. I mean, I I like to think there's at least some commonalities. I mean, certainly they, they published the guide to they, them pro pronouns, right? I mean, no yeah, one else in that, the comic yeah. space is, is doing that. They have the whole uh, uh, pornography line, which is, is not, it's not straight pornography, yeah. which is kind of fantastic. No, you know? I mean, I love Oni books. Mm -hmm. I, um, so when I started, back to an earlier conversation, I read, first I read American comic strips, and then I read almost exclusively just manga and Japanese mm -hmm. comics and sure. like and Korean comics and stuff and I really didn't get into reading West like American comics until a couple of years after that and Oni books were a lot of the first like sure. books that were stepping stones for me between manga and reading like sure. Western Scott comics. Scott Pilgrim. Scott Pilgrim mm -hmm. and the Courtney Crumlin series. Yep. I love Tiffany yep. Faye. Yep. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very familiar with Oni books and I, I love Oni books. I in fact have submitted and had been rejected from Oni with, for my The Thief's Tale project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd been like, I had been kind of like snooping out their editors for a while trying to be like, who would be the most interested in this? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I definitely think that there's a lot of potential to make really interesting and good work. I just, like I said, it just feels like a new company that we just have to wait and see. Yeah, no, and, and it's certainly strange when the person who shepherded I know. you through is no longer there anymore. Yeah. And yet you're with this company and, yeah. you know. I mean, the one thing I'll say is that they, as a company, were so behind this book, I, I don't know that I've seen such quite a full court press yeah. to retailers. You know, yes. like, this is a serious book. You need to stock this book. This is important. You should pay attention. And they were right. I mean, this is an important book that people should pay attention to, I think. Yeah, I have absolutely no complaints on. I mean, I like I said, working with the editorial has been amazing. Working with the marketing has been amazing. Um, yeah, um, uh, they're they've been they've, yeah they that and that for me has been the biggest change from being person as someone who was self published for years and years mm -hmm. and years to going to having a, a pu actually publishing deal is the really the marketing and the distribution light years beyond anything sure. I could have done on my own. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, like putting it, like, you know, sponsored ads on these websites that I've never right. even heard of but are apparently really important to booksellers. Like, I didn't know what, like, Idlewise mm -hmm. was. Sure. I still don't fully, like, you know, and like, and like things. They're yeah. a service that puts PDFs and things out to yeah. booksellers so yeah. they can check out books ahead of time. Yeah, it's really important, apparently, yeah. if you're a retailer. Yeah. And if you don't, you've never heard of it. Sure. <laughs> um, yep. So, yeah. Sorry. Insider baseball. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, all right. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go a little more general then. Yeah. Let's let's stop the insider baseball because because I like it and you like it. I love it. Like no one else it. Um, <laughs> I like nothing more than talking shop. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, craft wise, Phoebe uh, is is the colorist of this. How did that come about? That you decided either not to or or to bring Phoebe in or talk about that process a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so interesting note, so Phoebe has switched pronouns since this book has been published. Oh, so okay. readers of the book, uh, we use she, her pronouns and the word sister for Phoebe in the book. Um, and that's perfect. I think that's perfectly fine to talk about like Phoebe, the character. Um, but Phoebe, my sibling, who I love and adore, uh, now uses they, them pronouns, um, as of like two months ago. And I've already, literally they, this wasn't a surprise to me. It was something we talked about. Um, but Literally, they like were like, "Hey, I'm switching to these pronouns," and like the first thing I said after like, "I love you and I support you," was like, "Hey, if you ever want to write a book, I'll draw it. <laughs> if you want to write your memories of our childhood, mm -hmm. think about it—a box set. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just, just let me just—I know you came out yesterday, but let me just like plant this seed early. Um, anyway, so I, like I said, I mostly work traditionally. I knew that if I was to digital color the book myself, it would both be. Uh, n not great, and it would take forever. So I had told Lion Forge early on, um, I had actually pitched a black and white book, and they were the ones who said, let's do it in color. So I was like, okay, well, if it's going to be in color, I want a colorist, because I, it's just, it would, it would be so frustrating. It would be so, it's not a good experience for me to do that myself. And I immediately, and then my sister, um, again, this is new, my sibling, Phoebe, um, 
is also an artist and works much more in digital than I do. Um, they went to Otis College of Art and Design for motion graphics. Mostly they work in advertising and it was quite a pay cut to work as a comic colorist mm -hmm. for six, six to eight months on this book. Um, but it's a you know, project of passion for both of us. And I knew I wanted to work with Phoebe for a couple of reasons. Um, one being, there's so much I wouldn't have to explain. Um, Phoebe was there for almost all my childhood, sure. so I wouldn't have to explain things like, remember the warm quality of light in our childhood home. You know, this scene, I want it to be bluish because it was stressful, or like, this is what this person looks like, or like, you know, this is like the color palette of our elementary school. Like, Phoebe knows all those things because they were there too. You know, they've been to every same school that I went to, every job that I've worked at, you know, they would visit, mm -hmm. you know, they have mm -hmm. been in those lo locations. So I knew it would just be this really, it would be, again, it would cut out a huge chunk of um, sort of like the explaining process that I would have had to gone through with a colorist that I didn't know. Sure. And then also it is a very intimate book. And like there are scenes where I was like, there are a few scenes that were genuinely hard for me to draw. And I knew that I wouldn't have to explain that to Phoebe and then I wouldn't have to like, like go through like just like a mostly the pap smear exam scenes mm -hmm. with someone that I maybe didn't know as well sure. and try to explain like this is why I want the colors to be this way because this is the emotions of that scene. Phoebe would just like no. Mm -hmm. And then also I mean, we got to talk on the phone all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we had actually t been talking about starting a podcast right before we started this book because we're like we have to call each other more. We are, we're very close. We're like two years apart in age. We shared a bedroom until we both moved out for college, but now they live in Los Angeles and I miss them desperately all the time. And we are very bad at calling regularly. So we're like, maybe if we start a podcast, we'll call each other like every two weeks <laughs> or something. Um, At least to work together. And, yeah. uh, and then we started the book instead. So we had done, we haven't done the podcast yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and even if it was just to be like, hey, you really need those files. Um, mm -hmm. at least we'd be chatting and then usually we'd be like, oh, so how was your weekend? You know, so. How, uh, how much of the book was drawn when you brought them in? Um, I mean, I like pitched the project with them. Oh, okay. So I literally, like in the pitch packet, I was like, and it would need to digital colorist, I recommend my sibling. Very good. <laughs> so mm -hmm. nepotism mm -hmm. from day one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Sure. Uh, with so much of this being personal and mm -hmm. talking about family, how was it talking about things that were personal with your, your parents and how did they receive this? Great question. <laughs> um, uh, interesting. Good. Um, so my, I had been showing my mom the little strips periodically. And um, I, my mom has just had such, some such like great reaction lines that I have then turned into art. She's such a good sport about letting me draw her all the time. Um, like, so when I remember when I was showing her the strips, one of the things she said was, I didn't realize you had been thinking about this for so long. And I was like, yes, I have. Um, so I knew it was going to be, it was, I had to just accept the premise. I'm writing a book of which one of the subjects is sex and my parents will read it. Every person who has written a book that has sex in it has to accept the fact that their parents, if they're not dead, <laughs> may read it. So I kind of just had to accept that as a base level and just like be okay with that inside myself. And then my mom read it in drafts. So my mom read it, I think, at um, the penciled manuscript and then the inked manuscript and then when we were like fi finishing the colors. So read it throughout. I told my, I asked my dad, like, do you want to read it? Um, but he was like, I'd rather wait till it's like a book. And I was like, all right. Um, but I did print out every page that he appeared on and I made him read all of the pages that he appeared on to fact check them, which was good because he had actually catch a few errors. Um, so I, they knew, what, I mean, I, and I live at home. I'm 30 years old. I live with my parents. This is the only reason that I can afford to be a freelance artist in the Bay Area. Um, I would not have been able to make this book in a year or maybe even in five years were I, my career not 100% subsidized by my loving and supportive parents, um, which is a great privilege that I am aware of every day. Um, so I'm very close with my family. And I mean, I definitely, I mean, I prepped them. Like I told them, like, I'm working on this book just so you know there's this stuff in it, like you're, you will appear in it, like I'm publishing it under my real name, like just be ready, like I, I, I sort of prepped them throughout the process and, um, and they, um, and my mom had feedback, I changed a few lines of dialogue, especially the ones that my mom had said based on her feedback, um, nothing like drastic, but she was just like, I feel like you made it sound harsher than I meant it, and I was like, that's fair. Um, and um, yeah, so they're, 
they're really proud of me. And um, even if they don't get my pronouns right every time, like, my dad's so cute. Like, he, like, he, like, Googles it on Amazon to see, like, what book pops up and the, like, customers bought this with. <laughs> and he found that, like, one of the what customers bought this book was, like, George Takei's biography. And he's like, you should send a copy to George Takei. Aww. And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't know that it would reach him, but I love where you're thinking. Like, I love where that's coming from. No, so. I, I, we could, I'm sure we could figure out a way to get a copy to George Well, he's Takei. writing comics now. That's what I'm so saying. he feels I'm, more accessible. I, I, I'm sure that there's someone in IDW we could figure out yeah. a way to make that happen, if that was yeah. a thing you wanted to make happen. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, see, that seems like that could be done. Yeah. 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 Did that's, that answer your question? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay. I have a question on that. Yeah. Is, you mentioned having your parents fact check. Mm -hmm. Is that like a standard part of writing an autobiography, having family input, or is that just something you want it? Um, a little, both, a bit of both. Is that um, a legal thing too? You know, um, you do have to get written permission from everyone who appears in a, in a memoir. Um, and to, to what level is somewhat dependent on the publisher? So with Lion Forge, they were okay if, as long as I wrote an email to the person saying, like, you appear, um, this is, like, I would usually send them the pages that they appeared on, the, the, whoever it was. And I would often, sometimes, some people I ask, like, do you want to be, do you want me to change your name? Um, I usually wouldn't do that ahead of time unless I had, like, asked, like, I would ask the person, like, do you want that? And only a few people said yes, and I, of course, respected it every time. Um, and then I would usually just forward that set of emails to Lion Forge. So they didn't need, like, a signed thing. Like, I didn't, no one had to, like, sign anything. But they wanted to at least see, like, okay, you checked with so-and-so. Um, and actually, the reason why you even have to do this is because there was a faked memoir that came out a few years back. I don't remember the title of it. It was a prose novel, not a comic. And it was a person who wrote this whole memoir claiming this whole thing. And I don't, I've not read it. Is it the JT, um, JT whatever? I'm, I'm not going to remember now. I read an article on it because they were like, maybe. this is why. And I Googled it and I was like, yeah. oh, crazy. Yeah. Um, so if you, maybe if you Google it, it'll come up. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't remember any of the details. But mm -hmm. basically, someone made it all up. It was completely, it was completely faked. Um, and, but the publishers didn't realize that. And now publishers are more careful with mm -hmm. memoir. They make you do some, they do a little bit of more, more checking. So they're more worried about you making things up than people. Oh, I mean a little bit yeah. of both. Like they want to make sure it's not all a lie, um, for sure. And, but, and then it was also, it was very important to me to make sure that I didn't want to. I did not want this book to ruin any relationships. This was not a bridge burning book. I wanted this book to build relationships. I wanted this book to strengthen my, my relationships to my community. So it, it was very important to me, which is almost ties back into like the legal thing we we're talking about earlier. I was so careful. I checked with every single person, even people who don't appear on the page but whom I referenced. I asked, I mean, I like emailed, I had to, I had to go back and email my first grade crush because of the appearance. I, I mean, I emailed my one and only ex-girlfriend, like people that it was embarrassing to email, my high school crush. Like I emailed everyone to make sure that they were okay with it. Um, and I was so careful about that. And I just included all these celebrities because I was like, that doesn't matter. Um, well, they're public figures, right? I know, I know. The ghost you, of Oscar they, Wilde. They would think you would, they would like the publicity. <laughs> was uh, was Z one of the people who who asked to not have their identity? No, um, I actually just didn't want to say Z's okay. name. I just didn't. I felt weird about that. So mm -hmm. that was actually in my draft. I included um, Z as the one girl that I did it. Um, and um, you know, and I showed her the pages, and I asked, like, literally, if you want any, like, if you, I, I didn't really. It looks a little bit like her, mm -hmm. but I didn't really try. I didn't want her to be recognized. Sure. So I did not. I didn't make it exactly how she looked. Um, and but I was like, if it's too similar, I can change it. If there's like anything that's weird, if you feel uncomfortable, I literally will change anything. And she was like, no, it looks fine. And I was like, you're such a beautiful soul. How would I get so lucky with my one ex? Um, <laughs> yeah, I was actually, I was actually almost wondering about this. And you can tell me if this is too harsh of a question. But both with Z and with I forget the other, uh, the earlier one. Um, I feel like I feel like in both cases you really broke their hearts. Uh, and, and I and I'm not I'm not blaming you for that. I I just I I. I, but you, you almost don't confront it in the text of the work, oh. yeah? You know, like, like and, I, and, I, and, I, and I wonder, especially going through the process where you're contacting them, yeah. of I'm writing about this, yeah. did, you, did you go through that again? Or, 
or did you have to keep a distance or I'm sorry that no, me that that's... no no this is a great question I'm actually this is a great question um, so I think the other person you're referring to is the, the girl who um, yeah, in college I think the name is Autumn in the I want to say Autumn yeah that sounds great yeah yeah yep, yep yep so Autumn is actually someone I I didn't ask because I've completely lost contact with okay. her but I fictionalize it Autumn was not her name uh, that so like that that happened and the phone conversation is mostly real mm -hmm. but the, the other timeline I had to really condense it it happened mm -hmm. over like a longer mm -hmm. period of time um, I mean I feel like you crushed Autumn you know and and. <sighs> You know, not intentionally. So you weren't young. trying to. No, of course. You oh, were young, of idiot. course. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. You know, it took me a long time to realize coming out as bi was easy. Coming out as non-binary has been challenging, but not, like, not hard to pin down. Like, it's, it's so true that it's not like, there's no, there's no like, oh, maybe this isn't, like figuring out that I, and coming out about aromanticism and asexuality has perhaps been the most difficult because both of those things are, instead of like, so when I was like figuring out I was bi, I was like, oh, I have crushes on people who are male and female and gender ambiguous. So that's the proof, that's the evidence. But like the evidence of asexuality and aromanticism is a lack of evidence. Mm -hmm. So it's like much harder to pin those down. Mm -hmm. So like, um, I didn't talk about this super a lot in the book, but like you guys maybe know the term um, like heteronormativity. That's, we live in San Francisco. We know this term. Um, so I would say like as much as young people um, are, are very much sort of like have heteronormativity, I would say beamed at them from every single piece of media basically ever. Uh, a step more, even more meta beyond that is we have Rom, like monogamous romantic normativity beamed at people as well. And that is even existing inside queer media. There is an assumption that as an adult person, you will want to be romantic and sexually active mm -hmm. almost across the board. And if you aren't, that a lot of people are very weirded out by that. And so I, for many, many years, assumed that I, I mean, I am a late bloomer in almost everything. Didn't learn to read till I was 11. Sure. Didn't learn to drive till I was like 20. Didn't get a cell phone until I was like 21. Just like every, like, I mean, emotional landmarks, technology landmarks, learning goals. Like I hit almost every landmark later than my peers. Mm -hmm. Um, so I kind of just assumed like, well, I mean, everyone else keeps saying like, oh, you just haven't met the right person. At some point you'll want to do all this relationship stuff. And I was like, well, I mean, I guess, I don't know. It doesn't seem like I will, but everyone says I will. So is everyone wrong? Yes, they were. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I feel like, um, looking back, yeah, there are people that I, who were interested in me romantically. And it, I wish I had just been able to tell them right off the bat, I'm sorry, friend, but that's just never going to happen because I'm not made that way. Mm -hmm. And instead, what I said was like, well, not now, but maybe someday, because that's the messaging I was receiving from everywhere in the world. And so I, I don't know. So I, I maybe have broken people's hearts, mm -hmm. but it's because I didn't understand myself. Sure, I understand, and yeah. I, I, no, I, again, yeah, I wasn't does. trying to. Yeah, but, but in specifically about Z, um, like we dated for two and a half months, mm -hmm. which isn't that long. <laughs> and I, we, I mean, it was, we met on Tinder. It was very like, this is a flirty, like she had, was out of a recent breakup. We weren't like, we're looking for soulmates. We were like, I'm looking for a fun person to have sex with. You know what I mean? So we, we both went into it with like the same kind of vibe. And I think as soon as she was like, I think I might be interested in something more is when I was like, I'm not, mm -hmm. and I'm going to depart this, mm -hmm. this relationship. Um, so, and I think that because it was that tone, like actually reaching out to her wasn't hard. And mm. she came to my book signing at Petaluma mm -hmm. and okay. we chatted and she was like, do you want to like hang out? And I was like, I would love to hang out. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. I'm so, sorry. I wasn't, I, you know, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't accusing you of being no. a bad person or anything like that. No. It's, it's, it's how it plays on the page, right? Like yeah. on, on the page, it, it yeah. seems almost cold, yeah. uh, and, you know, and that's not from inaccurate. the distance of time probably as much that's as anything else, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I like all of us have flaws. Yeah, no, that's all good. Is it? Is it? Was it? Was it? Is it weird writing a memoir when you're so young? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, talk about it a little bit. I I guess. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, um, yeah, when I signed the book deal, I was 28. And I thought, who wants to read about a 28 year old? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, um, I was so resistant to memoir and autobio early in my comics making career. And a lot of it is that I was convinced that my life was far too boring for anyone mm. who wants to read about. Um, and it, that was coming from a place of the fact that I wouldn't, I would say that my life hasn't had that much external conflict. Almost all the conflict in my life has been very internal. And I, um, I didn't realize people were interested in that. But I should have known because I'm interested in that. Like, I like reading of other people's internal struggles. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It just took me a while to figure out that maybe people would also be interested in mine. Sure. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I felt like, who does he think he is writing a memoir right. before he turns 30? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it felt a little bit. And, like, some of, like, a couple of my family members were like, you're writing a memoir? Like, what? Um, and I was like, I don't know. They, they agreed to pay for it, so I guess well, I'm, right. I'm very glad you did it. And, and Me it, too. And it's important and it's excellent. But I, I, my next question then is, 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 what do you do next? You, do you know what I mean? Like, like this is a stupid old, makes me an old man reference, but there's an issue of Howard the Duck. Where, where that, that it's, what do you do the day after you save the universe, mm. right? Like, he had saved the universe somehow, and the next issue was, like, like kind of dealing with the come down of... You just lay on like, a beach and read a book. Right, but... Just read like, a comic and drink some lemonade. So, I guess, I guess part of my question is, do you feel that you now have to work in the idiom of memoir for the rest of your life? No. no. okay. No. Okay. I would like to write another memoir, but I have decided that I will start it when I'm 38. Okay. I want a decade to pass. Okay. I need to build up more life experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I will cert I will certainly, and I still write little short things. Like I write a fair amount for the nib. Um, and those are memoir pieces in mm -hmm, a certain sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I will keep doing just little doodly, whatever, small things. But I'm not going to write another memoir book until, <laughs> it, for at least another decade, mm -hmm. I've decided. Or they're about. Like that just seems like a good, I like round numbers. Sure. Um, no, I, um, I want to write all kinds of things. Like I have three children's book pitches that are pretty much what are, when are ready to go whenever a publisher wants to see them. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend who's writing a young adult sci-fi novel or a graphic novel that um, he's writing and I would draw. And then I have a fantasy young adult story that I want to tell that mm -hmm. um, includes you know, trans and non-binary teens and dragons. Um, and then I'm also, I am flirting with the idea of another non-fiction book, but it's much more of like a researched mm -hmm. book that I am, would be in it as a character, but it's almost more like a documentary okay. type thing. Okay. Does, does the existence of this make doing fiction harder, easier? Do you know yet? Oh, I chatted with someone about this earlier. I don't think they're here anymore. Um, so the existence of this book gives me confidence that I am able to finish a book yeah. because I have done sure. that now. Yep. But it does not make the prospect of writing a fiction book any easier. Mm -hmm. I am massively intimidated by mm -hmm. finishing a fiction book because I have written, I have written so many fiction projects that have got to about 75% mm -hmm. and then totally petered out. And so I am... Because I'm, of you or because of something external or... I think just because I was a young writer. Okay. And I wasn't ready yeah. yet. Um, the Thief's Tale, um, like I said, I drew 300 pages of a proposed, I think, four to 500 pages of that story mm -hmm. and then set it down and just have not even looked at it. Um, the main reason is that I, it was a, it's a student project. I started sure. it when I was in my early 20s and... Uh, it just has like a lot of kind of weird narrative structure problems that are so hard to fix when you've already drawn the pages. It's not like sure. a novel where you can go back and add scenes. Sure. Um, and also, um, I, I started it before I was thinking about representation and diversity in media. And mm. when I, after I had the first ever class I ever had that was about specifically about race in media, which was in grad school, which is a class by John Jennings, which was called Diversity in Comics, which maybe could have been called Lack of Diversity in Comics. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, every single character in this book is white. Mm -hmm. 
because I'm a white person. And when I was very young, I didn't think about that. And so I was like, well, that's a problem. And then also it's in a medieval fantasy setting. And I realized, I was like, oh, if I expand this world farther, I have to run into questions like, does this fictional world have the same kinds of um, like history of like imperialism and colonial violence as our current world? And if so, how am I going to speak like ethically about that and if not how do I imagine a world in which that had not happened and like how do I include like various cultures and I, I sort of like it got into the weeds of world building where I was like oh I wasn't thoughtful enough about the this at the beginning of the project and now I'm going to have to like retcon diversity into it if I want it to be a diverse story and I honestly think that it would be better if I just set it down and just started an entirely new story. I mean I think that's one of the reasons Tolkien called them hobbits and elves and dwarves to you know, at the end of the day, you can you can make things metaphors at that point. Yeah. Without it being explicitly. Yeah, but um, I love Tolkien so much. Um, like I talk about this in the book, but I also like that's not the kind of story we need today. Sure, sure. I mean, to read written new, we still need it to read. We still need mm -hmm. it as a beautiful piece of like something that I read. I read the Lord of the Rings books every summer for five years. I mean, I'm a fan. Yeah, yeah. I've read the Souls trilogy out loud twice, wow. two of those times. Wow. Um, I read it out loud to Phoebe, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. who I knew would never get through it otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, I don't think that's the stories that, like, that's not what needs to be written in 2019 and in 2020 and in 2021, I don't mm -hmm. think. Okay. Question? All right. Let me ask this one then. <clears throat> um, so, so Phoebe is using they them. You're using is it Spivak or Spivak? Um, I say Spivak, but okay. I could be incorrect okay. because I. Uh, it's like Kobabi. Kobe. I was going to say yeah. I don't know. So it's named after a specific person, mm -hmm. Michael Spivak, and I I don't know. I've. I haven't been able to find out very much about Michael, except mm -hmm. that he wrote a book using them, which was a technical manual, and that's sort of like, and then it got from technical manuals into like online gaming spaces into queer spaces. Mm -hmm. So like, I know the history of it, but I don't know very much about the okay. guy whose name is on it. So. Okay. So, but you're using, you're, you're both family members and you're using different, different pronoun structures. Yeah. And... Is obviously you should be called what you want to be called, and we should respect what your choices are. But isn't it really difficult to to individualize what has historically been a collective thing? Did I ask that in the right way? Yeah, and I would say the answer is yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that is a good question. That's a point a lot of people have brought up at various times, both in very unkind ways and in also very like curious, thoughtful, generous ways, mm -hmm. which is how I take your question. Um, how it was intended. I, so I, I tell that if people have read the book, um, I have been like waffling on they, them pronouns of, like um, in like 2016. And even three years ago, a lot pe less people were using they, them pronouns. So it was a weirder choice at that time when I was first thinking about it. Um, and then I re-met my friend, Jaina B, who came to the signing earlier. And um, Jaina had switched to EMR pronouns since the last time I had seen him. And we had this whole beautiful, wonderful, like deep conversation about gender. And at the end of it, we were both like, oh man, I never even asked your pronouns. Um, what are you using these days? And he, you know, explained the EMR specific pronouns. And I just got this like full body, just like shiver of just like, Oh my gosh. And it's a feeling that has a name. It's gender euphoria, um, which is something that's talked about in trans circles as the opposite of gender dysphoria, a feeling of discomfort in your body. It's a feeling of just delight in your body and in your gender experience. And it's like, I got this feeling of gender euphoria that has not, it has only been matched the first, like to the first time I got my, sh like a first short haircut. And it was a feeling that was illogical, irrational, hard to defend but also undeniable. And it was like, I chose these pronouns not because they're easy or because they are sure. convenient, but because I love them. Sure. And, and that, that decision is challenged. Like now, 
three years on, they then pronouns are way more used and I'd say are more accepted and are, I think, heading in the direction of being the mainstream non-binary choice. Sure. And sometimes I'm like, well, maybe I should switch to they, them, or I should use them equally. And if people use they, them for me, I'm never mad. Um, it's like my, I would say they're my second, you know, they're my second favorite. Sure. Um, uh, but there are reasons why I chose EM Air. And like I said, one of them is that just that I love them. Another one is that because people were arguing about they, them more when I chose EM Air. And one of the arguments was, it's too difficult. And I was like, well, let me choose something that makes they, them look easy. <laughs> <laughs> And if I can be the loud weirdo on the fringe and make life easier for my other non-binary friends who use they, them pronouns, I will consider that a win. Um, so there are some political reasons, I mm -hmm. guess you could say, as well. And um, I mean, yeah, it, it, is, it is somewhat challenging. I, I think it's, I, I don't, I think they're easy to use in writing because you can just write they, them, or there and then just take the TH off. Um, but it is difficult to use them fluently in spoken conversation right off the bat. Like, sure. I've practiced a lot and I still occasionally mess up. Um, but then, like, there's a moment in the book where my mom sort of has this slip up and then she goes, Why are you doing this to us? Mm -hmm. As if my pronoun choice was, like, mm -hmm. about her. Sure. And what I, you know, and. For one, and like the the honest answer is, I'm not doing this to you. I'm doing this for myself, and I want you to be in my life, so you are affected by it. And we have like a mutual like relationship of trust and respect and love. So we have each chosen to be in each other's lives. So we're choosing to respect what the other person wants. Um, but my snarky answer is like, what in the book is like, I mean, you do like you know, the, what are, what are they called, Sudoku's all the time? Like, mm -hmm. you don't you want to keep your mind sharp in your old age? Sure. Can you think of a better way to keep your mind agile sure. and sharp than like learning a whole new pronoun set? Sure. Like you're having to make new connections in your brain. Like, I feel like, yeah, it might be difficult, but it's, I think it's good for people. Oh no, and I, and I, I accept that premise at its base. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm asking as, as a person who has to to mm. relearn things at mm. 50 is much harder than relearning things in 20s and yeah, 30s, okay? Yeah, that's true. Um, is, is there, and it's, this isn't your question to answer even specifically. Mm -hmm. You just happen to be sitting here. Oh, and I'm, I'm game okay. to give it a shot. Okay, I, so, so at, at, at what point do we, do we accept each individual's desire? Right, to be like called if, each individual thing. Like would we, if there was like a one-to-one -one relationship of pronoun to human? Yeah. Yeah. So like if each right. person uses exactly, them. and I know that I know that's not really a fair question because that's not the way that the world actually works. But I, but, it, it's part of what I struggle with because I yeah. very much want to use the pronoun that you want to use. But yeah. man, if there's multiple ones and in different circumstances, I can't remember. Is this person that? Is that? Mm -hmm. per How do I do it and not feel like an ass? I guess. Well, so a few few different points to that. Um, one being, I don't think this is a ridiculous thing to ask because there are people who, especially kind of on the naysayer side of it, who are like, well, yeah, where will this trend of personalized pronouns end? Will it end with a, a pronoun set for every single human? Sure. And I'm like, obviously that's a logical absurdity. I don't think we're going to end up there. But if you're the type of person who likes to like argue like logic and semantics, I can see where you can say like, this is a possible, possible like f um, extent of this path that maybe we're on. And you know, there are a few different things you can say about that. One, it's unlikely we'll get there, so maybe you don't need to worry about it. B, I mean, everyone has their own individual name. Sure. How is it bad? I mean, it, let's think about it more like from a sci-fi point of view. If everyone had their own set of pronouns and it was like their name, but with like some letters added onto the end of it, we'd get there. I mean, and, it, sure. and especially if it was like in a sci-fi society where it was normal, it's... We'd get there. And then, but, um, oh man, I had a third point. Am I going to forget it? This is why I draw comics. Yeah. I it, feel like, I feel like um, if, we, if we lived in a structure where our language was more, had more gender usage in general, it would be easier for people to get to that point. Like if it was French, let's say, where every, oh yeah, the every item ending. is has a verb tense. So you're already thinking yeah. about parsing those kinds of things. But, but pronouns are collective nouns, mm -hmm. right, essentially, you know, um, oh, I remember or my, are used collectively. Go I, on, I, re I remembered my third point. This was my third point, is this is, uh, to your point of like not feeling like an ass or like feel, mm -hmm. not feeling bad of, of um, if you make mistakes, mm -hmm. is that um, in, a, in the ideal world, and of course, 
sometimes we're closer to it than others. Everyone will make their honest best attempt. And the people on the other side of that will recognize the honest best attempt and will see the good intention in it. And so then will not be angry about mistakes. Sure. So then it's like it's a two way street where you're trying your best. Sure. And I'm forgiving you if you mess up sure. because we both um, respect each other. Sure. Um, that sounds beautiful, but that's that, not the world that yeah. we actually live I know. in, so, right? Because, yeah. because there's the I know. because there's the whole PC culture of oh you're you're microaggressing, you know. Yeah, I, it's it's a bummer because there's there can be fault from both sides where sometimes there are people who are just not trying, which is unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely. And then on the other hand, there are people who uh, angrily jump on every mistake, even if it's done in very innocent error mm -hmm. with the best of intentions mm -hmm. and if only we could all be as patient with each other as angels yeah wouldn't that be beautiful it would be beautiful um and the only thing we can do as an individual is just try to idealize that as best we can in our interactions with others and be generous and be forgiving and be loving with yeah. everyone um and try to materialize the world that we wish to see yeah no and i and i agree with that and i think i think this book is a fantastic first step to getting us to that place by giving us the point of view you know I, I i i was a child at some of the same times that you were i mean it, it's a little i'm 20 years later but it's still the same the same like kids are what they are right yeah. and and you know we're all freaks in our own ways yes. and 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 like i didn't i understand what you went through a lot better with this and i think it's really important um do we have any other questions here from the audience? Yeah. Please. Yes. Um, yeah. So, just shifting gears a little bit. Please. Um, when I read this, the the prologue is like you saying, um, "I'm not going to spill any of my secrets." Mm -hmm. So when I read that, I was like, "Oh, the end of the book, you're going to say." And that's when I decided to spill all my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's not really like a moment where that happens. Mm -hmm. and you, you don't really talk about it that much, and I'm wondering if that's not really something that you that there was never like a moment. It was just kind of like happened gradually yeah I, it's it happened I would say it happened more gradually um, I considered whether I should include more sort of meta stuff in the comic about the making of the comic and I decided not to um, partly because I just didn't think it was going to add much um, I have a feeling if I write that second memoir in 10 years, I will have to write about the process of writing this book sure. and what it has meant in my life because sure. that will probably be a significant thing mm -hmm. that I mean it will be considered a, an event of my life that is relevant to the story of gender um, yes it's um, yeah I never I didn't don't ha it would have been nice to have a little book ending moment that would have been really sweet you sh why didn't you tell me this a year ago huh. um, no, you, you could have drawn yourself as Frodo like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god and then the lawyers would have said you have to cut that um, yeah, it, it, I would say I didn't include that because it was a bit more gradual. And if I had included it, it would have been the moment of drawing those for 60 comics and then being taking the plunge of, I'm going to post these on Instagram. And I just didn't want to, I don't know, I, I, like I said, I, I considered including a scene of like, and then I decided to write about this and post it on the internet. But I was just like, it just felt a little too self-referential. And like the kind of thing you can do when you're a well-known author, but the kind of thing that seems a bit arrogant when you're a, a first-time author. Yeah. So what I would say is I read that exact same intro and it was more like, and here they are. Yeah. Like there didn't yeah. need to be that up below because you had, that was, that was the book. Yeah. It was like, here, yeah. here are my secrets. Uh, or at least many of them that you chose to share. Yeah. My Actually, question is. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. That was just an addendum. To yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is, what has been the experience of having your book out in the world? And how is that different from the things that you've shared on Instagram and in other stories? Having your book in people's hands and reaching a much larger audience, what has that been like? It has been overwhelming and incredible and um, much more emotional than I was expecting. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've been self-publishing since like 2012, so I have I have a lot of experience of like making a thing and yeah, like being at Zine Fest and selling them, but that's all very small scale on the distribution front, and um, it's been wild. Like, there's times I still don't half believe it, um, especially when I get things like someone will like message me and, and be like, "I bought it in Berlin," and I'm like, 
Berlin? <laughs> what? How did it get there? You know? Um, or someone will message me like, please say you're coming to Australia. And I'm like, <sighs> I mean, would I win the lottery? I don't know. Like, um, <laughs> oh, you. Um, yeah, so it's been really, I mean, the, the response has been um, overwhelmingly positive. I mean, the, the press has been really, really good. I just got a star review in the school library journal, like today. Um, it made, like, um, Barnes & Noble's best graphic novels of May, and it's already been nominated for something. It actually was nominated before it even came out, officially, um, which is just, you know, it's just astonishing. Um, and then the thing that I didn't expect. not to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and then I, I had no idea how many um, people were going to read it and then reach out to me personally. I've been getting a lot of messages, uh, email and Instagram and stuff, uh, people, you know, wanting to, usually saying, I just finished it. And I wanted to say, you know, what it meant to me. And um, which is, like, so... Uh, it's like so, it's so heartwarming and touching. I hardly even know what to do with it. And I feel like I want to write a personalized like thank you note to each and every one of these people, which I have been trying to keep up with. Um, and I just, yeah, I didn't expect that like the two to three weeks after the release of my book would be spent just writing thank you notes like all day long. Um, uh, but it's a really great feeling. Have you gotten any blowback? Very little. Mm -hmm. Like... Maybe I've not I've been looking for it. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for it at all. Um, I think one person made a mean YouTube video about it. Okay. I didn't watch it. Yeah. 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 But nobody's like emailing you like <laughs> you're the spawn of the devil or no, whatever those not people yet. think. Not okay. Yet. Okay. We'll see. Good. Yeah. Good. I know uh, one of an early person to read it was um, Jimmy Robinson, mm -hmm. um, who's published loads of comics. Mm -hmm. um, who's, I'm in a writing group with him, and he's a very sweet man, and he read the first half of the script, and he goes, this is really good. Also, you should go make friends with the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, like, right now, because this is going to get banned. It will. Yeah. yeah. It probably will. Yeah. And I was like, all right. And he, I mean, he's a guy who's had books banned, so mm -hmm. he knows. And I was like, mm -hmm. make note of that. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to out myself and say I haven't read it yet. Oh, Just... how dare. <laughs> uh, but since we were talking about it earlier, is yeah. there anyone, you were talking about this exact thing, is there anyone in this room who's in the book? Um, just, just myself. <laughs> yeah, but um, someone who was in the book stopped by earlier at the signing, but went home to go to bed early. So that, was a good, that was a good story you gave earlier about... Oh, yeah, I did. So my hometown signing, which was in Petaluma, there was one moment where I looked around and realized like six or seven people who were in the book were all in the comic book shop. And we forgot to take a group photo. Oh. So no record of that remains. Alas. That's not so good. That's okay. Mm -hmm. The last scene, uh, you're talking about working with kids and the next time I'm going to come out. Did you? Yeah. Has there been a next time? There has been, and I didn't. Yeah. Um, but I came out in different circumstances. I don't know. It's that's um, or maybe it's, well. There have been there have been some times where I've come out, and other times where I haven't. That would be more accurate to say. Um, I was teaching a batch of high school students, and that seemed appropriate. Like I was, I didn't worry about their age groups. Like it seemed like they're like they can handle this. So I did, in, I did come out and use my pronouns and write them on the board and stuff when I was teaching. The next time I taught a batch of high school students, but the next time I taught this particular class that's referenced there is, um, it's their Girl Scouts, mm -hmm. and sometimes the batches are older than others, mm -hmm. and the next batch was like they just looked so young, mm -hmm. and also some of their moms sat in on the class, and right. I was like. I'm not ready for this. Um, so that's when another interesting thing is when I first started using the EMR pronouns, I was very militant about using them in every circumstance. And I've become much more choose my battlesy about it. Um, and it's I've what I've realized is that there's there are times when it feels really productive to introduce them and to start a conversation about it, and there are other times where it does not feel productive. And honestly, I'm better off saving my energy for the productive times so that I can be just more, just bring my A game when it's gonna mean something. And maybe not, like I, tr I remember I tried to use them at the dentist office. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> Not worth it. Okay. Not worth it. Yeah. How do you how do you know that it's worth it or not? Is it is it that they're responding right away or It's more about what kind of relationship do I have with this person? Early very early on I decided I am never correcting a, a wait staff person mm -hmm. on my pronouns because uh, waiters um, they, I would much rather they remembered my food order than my pronouns. Mm -hmm. And also they are working very hard, they're on their feet, they have to remember a million things, and it is, it doesn't matter if they call, if I get called ma'am in a restaurant. Like it's, it's not gonna injure me, and I just don't wanna make a hard job harder for someone. Sure. And that's part of that like extending courtesy to another sure. human being. Um, so I do not use them in restaurants, and I do not use them in places where the interaction is like a brief one where like, I'm probably never gonna talk to this person again. The places where it is important to me, it is very important to me to use them in a professional sphere. Mm -hmm. So I always use my pronouns and I always correct people when I am t like um, in a comic setting, in work emails, mm -hmm. um, when I'm doing interviews, mm -hmm. um, when I, anything like that. That is the most important. Friends is the second most important. Family is like, it's like a third most important. Like I will correct my family, but I'm not like, sometimes I won't, I'll correct them like once in a conversation right. and not the next couple of times. And then maybe like the fifth time I'll be like, just FYI, you messed up last four mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't want to break your flow because that was a really great story. Like, please do tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, cause so, um, I just try to gauge, the, I just try to gauge the room. Yeah. The dentist sure. office is not the room. Sure. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, I think that they, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Please, Miles. Um, just wondering, is dude gender neutral? Such a good question. <laughs> um, um, ah, yeah. I use dude and man a lot. I'm from California. Yeah, um, I would almost say yes, but the thing is, is not everyone says yes. So, like, <laughs> I am fine being called dude, and I will call other non-binary friends dude, but if they're like, I don't really like being called dude, I'll be like, okay, I won't. And I will try my very best not to, and if I slip, I will say, ugh, sorry. Um, so I'm okay if you call me dude, but uh, yeah, that's kind of a check-in on, I would say, with other NB folks. Yeah. Good question. Uh, related to that, what about you guys? Oh, that one is more gendery for me. And that one, um, I, so I, I do teach, and I used to say you guys all the time in the classroom. And I've been working very hard to get that out of my language. So now I address every class instead as dear students. And I just, dear students, we are moving on to the next exercise. Dear students, if we get a little bit more quiet in the classroom. Um, so I have, I have very, I've been pretty good on the you guys. That one, I got, for me, I don't know, dude is almost like um, and like, I don't know, it's like a, it's like hella, it's just one of our words. It's just, we're from California, I don't know. Um, but you guys, to me, is a little bit more. But again, if, if someone says that to me, I'm kind of like, hmm, I don't know, I'm just. Just FYI, it's the opposite on the East Coast. You guys is gender neutral, dude and is not. So, I love these regional yeah. different, yeah, yeah, see? You yeah. just be like so, Texas and call everyone y'all. Y'all's yeah. <laughs> yeah. gender neutral. No, I've, I've done that in mixed, rooms before and I'm wondering like what do you call a group of your friends? Oh. What would you be like, hey um, I might just say hey all or hey friends or like I don't know, I really like my friends. So I might just call them darlings or hey my loves. I don't know. I really like my friends. How much do you like your friends? <laughs> Put me on the spot. <laughs> hey sweethearts. All right. Hey my loves. <laughs> hey human beings that I love very much. Yeah. <laughs> I think the last place that I wanted to ask you about about the text um, is there's the scene, and I don't have it flagged or anything, but the scene with um, with your aunt. Yes. Uh, where she's, I, I I don't I don't know I don't know the right way to put what her complaint was in terms of. I mean, I think it has to do with with being a feminist of a certain age. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Is that a common thing that you encounter? And again, is this the kind of thing that will just time will eventually make all of us old people die, and 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 you know, so so language will change the way it needs to, or I didn't ask that question right, but you know no, what I no, mean. No, 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 I understand what you mean. So um, yeah, the section with my aunt. 
um, that is a that's a big piece. Um, and if you ask me, like, what one person were you most thinking of as the audience for your book? It's my aunt. Okay. Who's in the book? Um, she was so she came out as a lesbian feminist before I was even born in like the seventies. I actually had another out. Uh, queer family member who came out even earlier. This is part of why I knew it was going to be very easy to come out, especially my mom's side. It's like I already had out family members. Um, so when I was first coming out as non binary, I figured this is my Aunt Sherry. We're very close. We talk a lot. Um, we have the same taste in books, and like we've been nerding out since I could learn to read. Um, so I figured, oh, well, she's going to get this right away. She probably knows more queer and trans people than anyone else in my family. It's like she's going to be my corner right away. And that really, that wasn't quite the case. Like, she actually struggled with it maybe more than some of my other family members because she'd actually thought about it a little mm. bit more. And yeah, it is, like you said, it is kind of a generational thing. There, um, specifically, um, some like feminists, which s somewhat Venn diagrams with lesbians, but not as 100% overlapping, of a certain era. Um, sometimes have beliefs that are um, trans exclusive beliefs that are like sure. it's just a feeling of that trans women should not be allowed in women's only spaces mm -hmm. that a trans woman is going to somehow make that space like less safe mm -hmm. um, this is a real bummer of a belief um, I it's it's hard because it's often coming from a place of really deep pain um, a lot of times the person who feels that way has been really hurt by sure. the world sure. and that person deserves to feel s safe but so does the woman who happens to be trans yeah. who may also have been really injured by the world right. and it's it's this place where people's traumas are directly sort of like hitting into each other and creating even more trauma for everyone which is just really sad and it's it makes me really sad that especially when because it, it causes infighting amongst queer and feminist and lesbian spaces mm -hmm. and in a way that's just like ah oh, I wish we could all unite because there are so many other forces opposing us I wish we could all work together and this is just like a place of conflict that I don't know maybe time will resolve it though unfortunately there are like also young people who are actually picking up these beliefs from sure. their elders so the, the beliefs aren't just going to like slowly totally fade out they actually are being reintroduced at like the intro level as well um, so I would say that my aunt had some, what I might call like proto turf beliefs, mm -hmm. but, um, she very much was saying, look, this is a thing that I feel, but I recognize that my feelings on this are probably outdated. They're coming from kind of a while back in the community. And I'm very open to new information about this. She would say things like, please like recommend me some reading. Like I, um, do you have any like query favorite trans authors? Like what book should I be reading? And we were both like again, we were committed to the relationship of like respect and care. And so we were both willing to sit down and hear each other's sides and have a conversation about it, knowing that we both loved each other. And so that it was a safe space, even if we disagreed on things. And both of us were willing to like, let our, like hear the other one out and be like, I see why you're saying that. Mm -hmm. um, I wish that was the case with everyone who had these beliefs would be willing to sit down to like a really like thoughtful, deep, emotional, like caring kind of conversation in which maybe their, their views could evolve. Um, but some people are going really hardcore on the exclusion of trans people in, in otherwise feminist spaces, which is, yeah, one of the, it's going to be the, a continuing struggle in, in queer spaces going forward for yeah. probably a while. People are dramatically more complex than you would think that they, they might be, that, you, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've watched it from the outside living in San Francisco for the last 30 years and just watching how many gay men can't stand lesbianism, period, you know? And again, uh, why are and, we... And, and you're like, but you're on, the, you're fighting for the same thing at the end of the day. Which I... is to be treated like a, like a human being. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. I exactly. know, I know. And, um, yeah, I, it's, it's really painful to see people in fighting like this. And I wish it didn't happen. I don't know the solution other than, like I said, just being open to, to just listening to people. Yeah. Listening to where they're coming from. Like exactly like you said, everyone is more complicated than you think. Yeah. And every job is going to take longer than you thought it will. Yeah. 
these are some truisms. Yeah, well, and, and that's why I think a book like that is like this is so important, that you're telling us your truth in a way that we can not just grasp, but we can internalize in a way that if you had made a video of it, I, I would probably have bounced off it, yeah. to be honest, you Same. know? Yeah. Um, but by being able to live in your head and, and again, see, oh, you're just as much of a, a geek nerd as I am. Mm -hmm. Holy shit, we've got all these things in common. So, <laughs> wow, I actually get what you're saying, yeah. you know? Um, it's important. And, I, and so, I really want to thank you, thank you for making this book and for being brave enough to do it um, and for sharing it with us. Yeah. Yeah. So, Maya, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Oh, Thank you for making the book. That's 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 the the fantastic thing. Um, so just a little bit of business here. Um, I, I forgot to do it at the top of the show. I want to thank the Beat, uh, www.comicsbeat.com, um, who sponsors these shows and helps uh, bring it to a wider audience and helps get the message out. And it's really important. So go there, click, do whatever you need to 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 make that work. Write Heidi a letter going, thank you for supporting this. I, I, I really appreciate it. Heidi uh, was one of my editors very early on. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, I love Heidi. Um, and, then, uh, and then next month's book, uh, we're going to feature Die by Kieran Gillen, mm -hmm. which is a fantastic book. Man, this book is so good. Um, and the book plate, which I don't have a one in here, is, but the book plate's really beautiful, too. Uh, Kieran is here on July 24th. Uh, so put this on your uh, notes, and uh, hopefully some of you will come out, and uh, we'll talk to Kieran Gillen, who I apparently we now have to call Doctor Kieran Gillen because he uh, he got a he got a, a an honorary an degree. honorary degree from some college, so we're gonna have to call him Doctor Gillen, which will be utterly amusing. Um, and then the other thing I just want to just sort of point out to people is we have who is a, a god of comics making. We have Stan Sakai coming in. Uh, who's the creator of Usagi Ujimbo. That's June 29th. That's not connected to the book clubs at all, but uh, wow. noon to two on June 29th, Stan Sakai's gonna be here. So come out, because he, that man can draw, and he's, Usagi Ujimbo is great comics. Um, once again, thank you for this. Thank you for coming out. Thank all of you for coming out and being part of this conversation. Uh, I'm Brian Hibbs. This was the Comics Experience Craft Novel of the Month Club for June. We'll see you next month. Yay!